Good afternoon and welcome to We Rise here on 89.3 FM KPFB in Berkeley, occupied Ohlone territory known as Huchin. I'm Kat Petru, one of the co-producers for We Rise, and on today's show I am so delighted to bring you a rebroadcast from a show I did with KPFA's First Voice Apprenticeship Program called Full Circle. This show aired on January 26th in commemoration of the one-year anniversary of the SFO protest against the Muslim ban. Without further ado, here is Full Circle. Full Circle, yes, we roll the pace. 360 degrees, high, high, 360 degrees, high, high, 306, 306, 360 degrees, high, high. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Full Circle, your cultural affairs radio magazine produced by members of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. The show is written, produced, and recorded from Huchin, which is Ohlone territory known to settlers as the Bay Area. This weekend marks the one-year anniversary of the landmark SFO protest against one of Trump's first executive orders, the Muslim ban. On tonight's show, Lara Kiswani of the Arab Resource and Organizing Center gives a retrospective on the three Muslim bans that went into effect since last January. We investigate the connection between the bans and U.S. imperial and military interests. Then, we will be joined live in studio by two members of the Palestinian Youth Movement to investigate the move to make Jerusalem the capital of the settler state of Israel. And we will talk about the powerful resistance movements that have been fighting all along the way. All that tonight on Full Circle. I'm your host, Kat Petru. Please stay with us. Good evening, everyone, and welcome again to Full Circle. As mentioned, this week's this week marks the one-year anniversary of the executive order of the first Muslim ban. This anniversary is an invitation to pause and examine the roots of this order and its impact on Muslim and Arab, com- Arab communities here and abroad. To speak to the evolution of the Muslim bans, and there have been three since last January, and their relationship with U.S. imperial and military interests, I spoke with Lara Kiswani of the Arab Resource and Organizing Center. Can you give a brief introduction to listeners about AROC, which is the Arab Resource Organizing Center? What needs gave rise to the organization and what exactly do you do? So AROC is a local grassroots organization that organizes the Arab and Muslim community. We came out of ADC San Francisco, a local chapter of the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee, which focused predominantly on civil rights. Um, And so in the early 2000s, after 9-11, we did a lot of work around special registration and anti-discrimination and realized there was a need for direct legal services to protect our community against FBI repression, but also immigration enforcement. And since then formed AROC, which has a service, advocacy and organizing approach and model to our work. So we provide direct services. We provide legal services and other services to support um, migrants who have come to the United States and need support are also activists and organizers in our community who are being targeted by the FBI. And we advocate for policies and shifts in in policies locally um, in conjunction and in coordination with other communities and other coalitions to fight for a way to build power in the Arab and Muslim community by organizing them. So essentially we have a youth and adult membership who also organize um, mostly around repression, war, and Zionism through issues that impact our community in very particular ways um, given our positionality here in the United States and our the United States relationship with Israel and also its um, you know interests and imperialist interests in terms of how it's impacted our people and forced them to come here in the first place. So essentially we organize people to fight against the conditions and to shift the conditions that force them to have to seek our services um, or come to Iraq in the first place. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That makes sense. Um, I don't think there's anything else I want to ask you about that. I think that's a really helpful overview. 
So this weekend marks a year, unless there was anything else you wanted to add? No, I mean, we. I guess it'd be good to name some campaigns that we do. Yeah, please. Yeah. So we do our organizing work um, through campaigns. So we've organized Block the Boat, which stopped the largest Israeli, Zim ship, largest Israeli shipping line from docking at the Port of Oakland and has since not come back since 2014. We also are a leading uh, organizing me- member in the Stop Urban Shield Coalition Against Militarism. And then we organize campaigns like the Arabic Language Pathway Program to fight for our communities in San Francisco to be able to learn Arabic in SF Unified School District. So we take on various campaigns that actually do build the power and shift the conditions of our communities here in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And what kind of outreach do you do to connect with folks? And to to start to build the visibility and the momentum of the campaigns. We do street outreach. Um, Our members do outreach. Our staff do outreach. But also we've been in the community for a while, so we have those relationships. And through our programming and our service work and our organizing, we are in direct contact with various sectors of our community. So that is an Oh, was the most difficult part. I think the hardest part is just making sure that people have ways to get activated and involved in, in some political organizing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So this weekend marks a year since our current administration put the original Muslim ban into effect. The executive order was really misunderstood in mainstream news and has gone through several iterations in state and Supreme Courts. Can you please clarify what the order was and talk about its impact on local communities? Yeah, well, the first Muslim ban was a full-out ban. Um, So if people recall the SFO shutdown, the first Muslim ban literally impacted people who were en route to come back to the United States mostly, Um, people who had visas, who were legally getting on airplanes to come to the U.S., and then were told en route that they were not allowed to enter the United States. Um, And it included, you know, seven countries, predominantly Muslim countries at the time. And so family members were awaiting their family members at the airport and then were being told that their families were being detained um, and not allowed to enter. And so that was the first Muslim ban. So it was an all-out ban against the seven countries, predominantly Muslim countries, stopping people with visas and refugees from those countries. It was then stopped in Supreme Court because of organizing efforts both in the streets and in the courts and has since been um, gone through various iterations. And now, of course, we know the Trump administration is trying to legalize it and the Constitution and the United States law provide an opportunity and vehicle to do so. So there's been various different, more politically correct versions of the Muslim ban. We've been calling them Muslim ban 2.0 and 3.0, but essentially they've added countries at this point. So now Venezuela and North Korea have been added. Um, They've defined or redefined what bona fide relationships mean. So that would determine what type of family members um, with visas would be allowed to enter. And then now, most recently in December, they've lifted the injunction. Um, So there has been an injunction or a restraining order against the Muslim ban because of organizing efforts. And in December, we learned the Supreme Court lifted the injunction, essentially meaning the Muslim ban 3.0 is in full effect. Um, so people who were awaiting visas and were told they were getting visas, who had went through the process for years through their family members here in the United States, are now stranded in different parts of the world because some of them had to leave their home country in order to obtain the visa. And so specifically Yemen and Yemeni community members who many of their family members are in camps and hotel rooms and motel rooms in Djibouti awaiting visas and now being denied and rejected visas since December. And all refugees from Syria as well are impacted by this. So Syrians are not allowed in the country as we speak. Yeah, to imagine what it would be like to be in that liminal state of not knowing where you can be, not knowing when or how safety might show up, not knowing if and how you can communicate with your family, with your loved ones. It's awful. And so all the more reason to make sure that we're talking about it so that more and more people can be mobilized to ensure that it doesn't continue and also to know the roots and the history of why this is happening so that there, it doesn't perpetuate further mm-hmm. Islamophobia, racism, all of those things that if you aren't paying attention are just shoved in your face, down your throat, mm-hmm. left and right. Was there anything else you can share about the impacts you're seeing on communities before we get into some more of the history? Sure. I mean, some of these community members have been here for decades and have applied for their family members to reunite with them and have been awaiting and gone through the formal process of immigration paperwork for years now. Um, So we have several clients who've um, applied and petitioned for their parents, their children, their siblings, 
all of whom now are not allowed to enter. And the real issue here is people don't want to come to the United States because they're bored and have nothing better to do with their lives. People are fleeing war and state violence, often perpetuated by the United States government. So when you have folks in Yemen who are facing war on a daily basis, fleeing their homeland, having to wait now in Djibouti because they've been told that the embassy there is where they can get their visa since there's no embassy in Yemen, following the directives of the United States government and staying in Djibouti and waiting for months, months on end. I mean, we have people who have basically set up a a temporary housing situation um, and are just awaiting this visa. And then come December, suddenly to hear that all these visas are being rejected. This has devastated community members. Not only, you know, the trauma of having to know that your family is going to be further divided from you, but also the fact that you've been spending all this money. I mean, most of the time, having to live outside of your homeland means, and, you know, temporarily is very costly. So people are sending money back home and trying to support their families. They've invested in this process because they assumed they would actually be able to reunite with their families, which based on the process that they started would have resulted in us in such a thing. And so the fact now that folks are just separated and then refugees from Syria are not allowed to enter. I mean, this is appalling and this has been an ongoing controversial issue even in mainstream media. But as we speak, this Muslim ban literally is stopping Syrians from being able to enter. So now we have to remember that when we talk about the Bay Area, the families, there's thousands and thousands of Arabs and Muslims in the Bay Area. And we don't even have an exact number because we're not accounted for in the census. But ultimately, we know from our work and from our own um, relationships that thousands of families are now impacted by this Muslim ban, that thousands of people are not going to be seeing their families, that thousands of people are going to have to await their turn to be able to actually go visit their families if they can afford to. Um, So, you know, the impacts are serious, but that's even just on a technical level. And then, you know, beyond that, there's also other implications. The fact that people are banned because they're from these countries, the fact that people are targeted because they're from these countries also emboldens Islamophobia and anti-Arab racism and white supremacy that we know does actually exist here in the Bay Area, even the liberal Bay Area. So, you know, this is a pretty serious issue. And I think something that because there's been so many iterations of the Muslim ban, it's a little convoluted and confusing. Mm-hmm. Not everybody understands, you know, which ban, and which was it one, two or three? Is it in effect? Is it in the courts? You know, ultimately, people need to know that the ban is in effect as we speak, that Muslim community members, as well as folks from Venezuela and North Korea are being impacted. And this is, you know, having devastating consequences on their livelihoods and on their futures. Absolutely. So let's, I want to pick up on some of the threads you just named and talk Talk about forced migration and U.S. imperial interests because there's a story that folks are often told where it's like, oh, people want to come to the U.S. for a better life. Totally invisibilizing that this nation state of the United States is a settler colony to begin with and invisibilizing the way that its imperial and military tentacles are affecting lives elsewhere. So let's talk about forced migration and U.S. imperial interests. Why did this administration ban people from not only the seven countries in the so-called Middle East and Northern Africa, so uh, predominantly Muslim countries and Arab countries, but not exclusively, but also Venezuela and North Korea? Why did they make this move? Well, from the beginning, we talked about the Muslim ban as coincidentally um, being in direct parallel with U.S. foreign policy, right? And so I say coincidentally, sarcastically, we know for a fact that the countries that were banned have all been at the receiving end of U.S. militarism and U.S. imperialism. So the same countries being targeted, the same countries that the U.S. has interest in devastating and occupying and colonizing and exploiting its resources economically and politically. Um, And over Over the last year of the different Muslim ban, the ways in which it's changed and the iterations have also reflected U.S. foreign policy. The fact that they removed Iraq. They decided to remove Iraq with sort of the assumption that Iraqi people who would work for the government or would be informants essentially for the U.S. government would be allowed to enter. So it was an alignment with U.S. interests because they're still occupying Iraq in many ways and still control Iraq in many ways. Having Iraq off of the list enables them to have more direct contact with those people that they are that are essentially working for the U.S. government. And then the fact that they added North Korea and 
Venezuela, the two countries that they demonize and criminalize and have, um, you know, as Trump has been doing on Twitter and the U.S. administration has historically done, right, is to sort of threaten war against these countries. So it is in direct relationship to U.S. interests, U.S. imperialism, and the fact that it's all these countries are in, in Africa or in West Asia in areas that have been systemically targeted and exploited by the United States. It's not a coincidence. And so if he feeds the interest and serves the interest of the U.S. administration, not just Trump, Obama, and the previous administrations as well, to demonize and criminalize people from this region, the same region they're trying to make a case where they should go to war with these people. So the more you dehumanize a population, the easier it is to compel or convince your own population that there's a justification for war and there's a justification for occupation. There's a justification for exploiting and literally wiping out these people. Right, exactly. And thank you for naming that Obama was doing it also. I know it's really tempting to romanticize his administration and his presidency, but his administration was dropping drones in Afghanistan. And he's he's part of a long line of U.S. presidents and administrations that continue to do exactly as you said, vilify someone. For folks who want to dig deeper into this can look to Edward Said and his book or the film on Orientalism. They can watch real, R-E-E-L, real bad Arabs and see how this kind of vilification infuses um, media and so-called entertainment. And then, of course, in the Bush era, the quote, war on terror, becoming a way for administrations to use democracy or freedom as synonyms, actually, for U.S. capital interests. So the U.S. expanding globalized capitalism, democracy and capitalism actually being synonyms, and the administrations not caring at all whatsoever about any sort of freedom in any other country, rather just using these catchphrases to exploit the people and the land, as you said, and to colonize. Mm -hmm. You're listening to Full Circle on KPFA 94.1 FM. I'm Kat Petru, and you just heard me speaking with Lara Kiswani of AROC, Arab Resource and Organizing Center, about the Islamophobic, racist, and colonial roots that paved the way for the three Muslim bans that went into effect in 2017. Up next, we discuss the incredible SFO protest that happened one year ago. I was there and caught these voices on tape. Hi, my name is Angela Omulepu, and I'm here because I want to voice my resistance to the fascist policies of Donald Trump. He does not represent me or my interests or the people of this nation. I am a child of immigrants. My parents are from Africa and Panama. And I believe strongly that this is a time for people to rise up and heal the wounds that have been perpetuated for our history and to pave a new pathway, pave a new pathway to a future that is fair and equitable for all people. Thank you. I'm Nima. I am protesting the new executive order that Donald Trump signed in yesterday because it's just pure wrong. This cannot happen in America. We will not allow it to happen. Do you live here in America? Yes. Are you an immigrant? No, I was born here and uh, I grew up in Iran, which is where my, most of my families are from. I'm a U.S. citizen. I'm here to, for solidarity with all these people. I'm here today because Donald Trump given an executive order that is offensive, that is unconstitutional, that attacks a religion, that attacks people. It reduces people to the status of non-human. You can't ban people. People are humans. And I'm here because I know immigrants, because I'm a Muslim. And it affects my entire community when, when this sort of thing happens. Laura? Well, I'm here with my family specifically because I want my kids, even if they're too young, to understand what we're protesting exactly. I want them to see what democracy looks like and that to understand that they have the privilege of living in a country where it is, at least right now, still legal to attend a political protest and take part in a protest against something that we feel is unjust. I'm also here because I think the ban on Muslims entering the country or you know, citizens from the seven countries that have been banned is completely unjustified. How old are you? I'm 11. How old are you? I am 9 years old. What are you doing here today? We're here to take a relative to New Zealand, but we saw what was going on and we wanted to 
to help out and protest. Yeah, what is going on here? Mr. Trump, he's doing the bad thing. What's the bad thing? He's trying to stop the immigrants from coming. I don't want that because I have relatives who are also immigrants and I want love to be around the world. Do you want to say anything else? Yes. Yes. Go back home, Mr. Trumpy. Welcome back to Full Circle here on 94.1 FM KPFA. I'm Kat Petru, and those were sounds from the SFO Muslim Band protest last year. It's such a joy to hear those, those girls again at the very end. Special thanks to Free Will and Franklin and Ephraim Colbert for editing assistance on that piece. Let's return now to my interview with Lara Kiswani of the Arab Resource and Organizing Center to discuss the significance of this protest. So... Can you talk about the importance of the SFO protest, not only as a vital display of cross-movement solidarity, but also talk about how AROC and others who showed up challenged the imperialism and colonialism and militarism of the U.S. that we were just speaking about? Sure. I think, you know, SFO and the shutdowns across the country really spoke to people's commitment to fight back against Trump and fascism and to fight for people's dignity and freedoms. And speaking specifically from SFO, one thing that we intentionally did was not make it just about the Muslim ban. So when we protested and when we led chants and when we organized it, we challenged militarism in a very particular way. If we want to talk about challenging militarism, we do that well here in the Bay Area by trying to provide alternatives to policing, um, given the militarization of police. And so one thing we did in SFO was make sure we were not working with or engaging the law enforcement and police. We took over SFO Airport, one of the most highly surveilled areas and places in the world, a place that normally none of us feel very comfortable walking around. And suddenly we literally had our own places for first aid. We had, you know, places for children to play. We had taken care of food and everything you can think of really creating a space that reflected our values and our sense of community and commitment to one another. And also doing that in light of our politics, where we see ourselves as people committed to, as AROC, committed to everyone's liberation, all oppressed people. So, you know, we did not talk about the Muslim ban just as a Muslim ban. We made sure to say no ban, no wall, no raids. For us, that was very essential because we also wanted to make connections between all the other executive orders. Now, while the Muslim ban was really tangible and easy for people to sort of latch on to and, and resist and react to and respond to, we wanted people to be just as outraged about the ongoing ice raids that were continuing to happen as we were sitting there taking over SFO. The fact that police had been emboldened and Trump had bolstered policing in the United States to directly harm and impact black communities here in the United States. The fact that Standing Rock had also been under attack. Um, so in order, you know, the executive orders first attacked the indigenous communities in the United States. Then they attacked the black communities. Then they attacked the Muslim communities. Then they attacked the Latinos and others with the wall. So understanding that the orders themselves were a, were a reflection of U.S. history, of colonialism, of war, of state violence violence and aggression and understanding that if we make those connections, we too can build power and learn from each other and really fight back in ways that are more impactful. So we had people of color, mostly women, leading SFOs shut down. We made sure that we raised those connections and connected those dots between other people's struggles. And we did so not only in a, in a way of just discourse and, and tokenizing, but if you looked around at who was organizing SFO, who was coordinating the logistics, who was working on the program, it was those communities. We were really building across movements, making sure that we were all committed to getting those families freed because those families were being targeted by the United States and them not being free means none of us could be free. So we wanted to make sure that people and all of us fought back together to free those families, to free us all, essentially, understanding that our liberation was connected, that if we could win this, we can win more, that if we could fight back against the detention of these families at SFO, then tomorrow we can fight back against the ICE raids. Then we can fight back against policing, as we have done in the Bay Area. So I think SFO is a beautiful testament and illustration of the history of cross-movement building 
in the Bay Area and of our ability to actually work together and build alternatives, uh, alternatives to militarism, to policing, to war, to imperialist interests and forces. We really created a, an environment of a community that really demonstrated its values um, and put it into practice. And we, we said that a couple of times that night, I recall on the last day, that we were in fact practicing self-determination, something we all fight for on a daily basis and something that the U.S. government and all imperialist powers are committed to stripping away from us. So I do think that we made those connections intentionally so, but they weren't just in words. It comes from a history of the work that's been done on the ground here to build across communities and to fight with each other over decades um, of the onslaught of attacks on brown and black, indigenous, poor LGBTQ communities here in the United States. Absolutely. Everything felt so organized and it was accessible and just the fact that there was food, there were people bringing pizza was like just these basic needs is this to me a sign of, as you were just speaking to like long haul organizing where you take care of yourself, you take care of one another so that you can keep doing the work and keep showing up. And you know, the fact that we had put in place a network Bay Resistance in the fall as soon as Trump was elected to bring together faith-based community labor and other institutions to work together and to fight back together and mobilize in times of any attack on any of us. So we were able to activate that network at SFO and we had already gotten thousands of subscribers to our text alert system and AROC is a steering committee member of Bay Resistance and was really excited and proud to be able to activate that network to bring out all all different types of community members and to continue to build on the text alert system and, and so on and so forth, just to be able mostly to understand that when they attack health care, that we're going to show up. When they attacked immigrant rights, we're going to show up. When they attack Muslims, we'll show up. When they attack any community member, any community, any sort of sector, that we will show up collectively and build that power. And over the year, last year, we showed what that can do. So we were able to not only build across historical relationships, but activate people who hadn't shown up before who were just interested in fighting back against Trump and and you know subscribe to this text alert system and when they got that text they showed up um, and so I think that's also a testament to people's willingness to fight back in this moment but also get organized and mobilized and also really contributed to what we saw at SFO absolutely and for folks who may not be part of or receive those texts can you tell listeners how to do you know you can go to bayresistance.org and sign up for the text alert system as well as the email list to get updates on any actions that are happening in the Bay. Perfect. Okay. So the U.S., as we've named, is both a global imperial power and a settler colony, just like the state of Israel. In our next segment, we will delve into the occupation of Palestine. Let's talk about the connection between the Muslim bands and the move to claim Jerusalem as the capital of so-called Israel. So the Muslim ban and the relationship with the United States and the state of Israel are directly connected. So the move of the embassy or the capital to Jerusalem is in direct relationship to the United States' interest in imperialism and occupation and controlling the Arab region. And the Muslim ban and the countries that were targeted, whether in Africa or West Asia, are all countries at the receiving end of U.S. imperialism, of warmongering. And so if we understand that within that context, then the relationship between the United States and Israel is instrumental in maintaining Maintaining that in maintaining that control of the region. Um, and so any shifts in policy around the state of Israel and the United States are always going to try to feed into the U.S. interest in maintaining hegemony over West Asia and Africa. And the fact that they are able to share technologies, strategies, tactics further fuels the interest of the United States and Israel's partnership. But more so the fact that it's able to be an instrumental in maintaining U.S. imperialism in the region. So when we see the countries on the ban that are directly related to U.S. imperialism, and then you see the move happening around Jerusalem, you have to ask yourself, what is and why is the United States so committed to Zionism, to apartheid Israel? What role does Israel play in the region? And why is it that the United States continues to attack people from that region directly related to to those interests. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. For some folks who maybe have thought a little less about these connections, talking about U.S. imperialism or 
militarism might seem like it's happening somewhere over there, but the relationship between the United States and Israel is happening right here. And one prime example of that is Urban Shield. And in the beginning of our conversation, you mentioned that AROC is part of the movement to stop Urban Shield. Can you please talk about this campaign? Sure. Urban Shield is the largest SWAT training and weapons expo in the world, and it happens right here in the Bay Area for the last 10 years. We've been part of the Stop Urban Shield Coalition for many years now to fight to end Urban Shield and to not have it in the Bay Area at all or anywhere. We were successful in pushing it out of Oakland and has since been moved to Pleasanton, but agencies across the Bay Area, across the country, and across the world continue to participate, including some of the most repressive countries and agencies around the world, including Israel. Um, And so it's a place where different law enforcement are able to share tactics and strategies to better control and repress communities of color. These tactics and strategies are then used against people right here in the United States. And so officers involved in Urban Shield are some of the same officers who have murdered black and brown people in the Bay Area and across the country. So there's a way, and we understand this to be a war on black people in this country. Policing and militarism and imprisonment is a war on black people in this country. So the war we talk about abroad um, is directly linked to what we also see here because they're practicing those tactics and, and methodologies and using that technology in Palestine or in Gaza and then using it here in the streets of Oakland and other parts of the United States. Mm-hmm. Thank you. What strategies is AROC implementing right now to address the Muslim ban in particular, but also anything that we've been talking about? You know, our strategies haven't shifted much. Our strategies have been pretty consistent around trying to address the root causes of the issues that our communities face here. So we've said time and time again, it doesn't make sense. It's not logical to challenge the Muslim ban, but not challenge the wars and aggression in the Arab world. You can't challenge the Muslim ban and be okay with the war on Yemen or what's happening in Syria or the occupation of Palestine. All of these things are what cause and force people to move in the first place and need to come here. And all of them are at the hands of U.S. foreign policy and U.S. imperialism. But also one thing we are doing is making sure that people are equipped with the tools to be able to navigate society safely in this moment, given increased repression, um, increased attack on dissent, but also increased attacks and targeting of Arabs and Muslims. So we're ramping up our community defense work. We're making sure people understand what their rights are and what their options are. So you don't have to call law enforcement. Who else can you call? Developing new practices and cultures so that we're also making links between the relationship between ICE, FBI and police um, so that all of our communities are working together to make sure that we're all protected and taken care of in this moment. And we are continuing to do the real on the ground organizing, developing leadership of young people, of people most targeted and and most impacted so that they can lead the way and choose how it is they want to fight back and for the sake of what? We're denormalizing Zionism and denormalizing racism, making sure that people understand the direct linkages between war abroad and war here, always talking about military militarism and policing as also the root cause of some of the devastation here and getting engaged in direct campaigns that challenge them. And of course, just providing direct services. So there's a huge need now for people to be able to understand what their rights are, but also to get status in this moment, to get some kind of immigration status. So doing the direct legal services as part of our strategy always has been because we know people need a little room to breathe and have some tools in order to navigate society so they can feel empowered to fight back and get engaged and campaigns and organizing. Mm, thank you so much. For folks who might be interested in learning more or getting involved, what can they do? They can contact us, email us at info at ArabOrganizing.org. You can go to StopUrbanShield.org to learn more about how we're taking the fight against Urban Shield to Oakland and San Francisco. And you can go to ArabOrganizing.org to learn more about our programs and some of our activities. You are listening to Full Circle here on 94.1 FM KPFA. I'm your host, Kat Petru, and that was the voice of Lara Kiswani of the Arab Resource and Organizing Center. You can find all those links she just named on our website, which is kpfaapprentice.org. Thanks again so much to Lara for speaking with me and for all the work that you and AROC do. As Lara and I mentioned, our next guests will be able to speak even more thoroughly to the relationship between the Muslim bans and this administration's move to make Jerusalem the capital of the settler state of Israel and the site of the U.S. Embassy.
Before we speak with members of the Palestinian youth movement about this and more, we'll take a quick music break. Please stay with us. Welcome again to Full Circle here on 94.1 FM KPFA. That was Al Kufi Arabi, Arabi by Shadia Mansour, popularly known as the first lady of Arabic hip hop. And the song talks about the Kufi being a very some being very symbolic in the resistance movement in Palestine and uh, abroad. I'm your host, Kat Petru, and I am so thrilled to welcome two members of the Palestinian Youth Movement to the studio this evening. We, I'm sitting here with Mesa Morar, former general coordinator of the PYM USA branch, longtime member and community organizer in the Bay Area for over 10 years. She is currently working on her master's in physician assistant at Samuel Merritt University here in Oakland. And Jennifer Mogonam is a PhD candidate in ethnic studies at UC San Diego, formerly served as the research and development coordinator for PYM International, and currently serves as the national advisor for PYM USA. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you for for inviting us. us. So let's get into this. It is critical that the public do not see the Muslim bans and Jerusalem as two separate issues, which is why I'm so grateful you're able to join us on the show tonight. Before we launch into that discussion, however, will you please tell listeners what the Palestinian youth movement is and what you all do? Definitely. Uh, Thank you again for having us here. It's such a privilege to be here. Um, So PYM, Palestinian Youth Movement, is a transnational grassroots organization of, just as our name says, Palestinian youth. And basically, we have come together as youth in the diaspora, um, mostly out of a necessity for a space for Palestinians, uh, especially a necessity after the Oslo Accords, which happened in 1994, which was a really pivotal moment in Palestinian history in that um, it really divided our international movement and growth. And so this space is provided a natural space for us to come together politically, um, culturally, and really all of the above. It's it's really essential to um, our resistance movement in general, and it's essential, we feel, for Palestinians all over the U.S. and in the diaspora to have a space that they can call their own and a space that they can come together um, and basically that's who we are yeah thank you Jennifer did you want to add anything um, so some of the work that we do uh, in the United States as PYM is um, of course we're trying to gener- uh, to um, generate a new generation of um Palestinians uh, and politically develop them um, in order to contribute to the liberation of our homeland from where we are living here today. And so a lot of our projects uh, are really situated in the local and how the local connects to that transnational connection. Um, So some of the work that we're doing right now 
so we do work with community youth, uh, empowerment, leadership development, political education, and also working with local students. Um, we're also actively engaged in refugee support and community building, especially um, in our places where more um, refugees are being resettled in larger numbers. The Bay Area isn't taking on so many refugees, no. um, particularly from Syria right now, as Lada mentioned. Um, but in other places in the country, they're uh, much more heavy presence. And lastly, something that's really important in terms of um, connecting Palestine to the work that we do here is really building with other third world allies and others that are most vulnerable communities here in the United States and really trying to build the connections for um, a joint liberation. Right. Just like Lara was saying with Iraq, there's so much fundamental solidarity in the work that you all do. So central to this conversation is a fundamental understanding that Israel is a settler colony occupying stolen Palestinian land. Can you please share some history about the theft of Palestine? Yeah, definitely. Um, First, I wanted to start off by defining how we talk about Palestine. Um, As the Palestinian youth movement, we define all of historic Palestine as Palestine. So traditionally, people get a little confused. They hear words like Gaza or West Bank or 1948. And so as Palestinians, what that means for us is just how... Palestinians are divided geographically. So geographically, the West Bank is just the uh, is just what the West Bank is, and um, it's adjacent to Jerusalem and part of Jerusalem. And then we have the Gaza Strip, uh, and then we have forty eight. And we say we call it forty eight uh, mostly because these are Palestinians that live throughout historic Palestine or what is known today as uh, Israel. But we don't uh, identify Israel in our lingo and in our language. And so you'll hear us oftentimes talk about Palestine. But what we mean by that is all of historic Palestine because we see ourselves and our and, and the recognition of our people as the people that were there first. And so basically when we talk about the uh, the initial land theft of Palestine, uh, when it really started, like I mentioned, was in 1948. Um, and Jamal will talk a little bit more about this, but this is a specifically a significant year for Palestinians in what we call the Nakba or the catastrophe. And this year is actually marks the 70th anniversary of uh, 1948 and the Nakba. And so basically this is when the... British colonies established Israel as um, as as Israel at the time, and uh, in which they've slowly and progressively kept stealing more and more land. So, yeah, just to talk a little bit about the history of the theft of land and what's been going on for the past century or so. Um, so. 1948 marks a really important point of departure, um, which Palestinians call the Nakba. Uh, This year will be our 70th commemoration, so stay tuned for more events regarding Nakba 70, and hopefully y'all can engage more in some of the different ways in which um, we're engaging Palestine 70 years later. So I wanted to talk a little bit Um, Very briefly, but just to say that the Zionist movement, which really propelled forward the establishment of the state of Israel, um, was established in the late 1800s. So the Zionist movement is a political ideology coming out of Europe that was working to find a national homeland um, for the Jewish people. And this Um, While religion was often used to mobilize Zionism, the founders of the Zionist movement identified as socialist and um, not super religious, actually. But they were looking for a mobilizer um, and a way to get 
backing so people behind them uh, there's a lot more history to this but this is just to say that the zionist movement and zionist immigration to palestine started from the late 1800s and so as long as different powers the zionist um gangs that came in as well as the british have been present in palestine palestinians have been resisting um so palestinians have been resisting since 1948 and before that um and so while the Zionist state of Israel, the colonial state of Israel, continues till today to continue annexing land, um, to continue normalizing violence against our people, uh, we continue to resist in all of the ways that we can. Yeah, thank you. It is a huge history, and it's one that is really profoundly and commonly misunderstood, I think. So I really mm-hmm. appreciate that, just a bit of it. Um, and there's a lot more to get into and I was going to say let's definitely we can certainly do more coverage considering this significant year and um, I'm committed to really also ensuring that people don't conflate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism they're two incredibly different things so Mm -hmm. moving forward um, in light of my discussion with Lara um, of AROC, the Arab Resource and Organizing Center, about the role U.S. imperialism and militarism play in the so-called, again, this is not a neutral framing, the Middle East. Who who decided that's what that region was called, right? <laughs> We're not going, not getting into that right now. Um, is there anything else you want to say about the role of Israel, so-called Israel, or settler state, um, Israel's role in this region? Yeah, so... I'm going to mostly stick to the bordering countries. Um, I think it plays a large role across the region, but I just want to point to a few concrete examples that really exemplify um, some of the detrimental roles in which um, the state, the Zionist state is playing in our region. Um, So two of the most obvious things is that not only is the Zionist state occupying Palestine, historic Palestine, but they have also occupied the Golan Heights in Syria, um, as well as parts of southern Lebanon. Um, And even though in 2000, Um, There was a victory claimed that southern Lebanon was no longer occupied. There still are parts of southern Lebanon that are being occupied um, by the Zionist state. So that land colonization um, really does affect our other Arab counterparts and other parts of the Arab world. Uh, I wanted to draw a little bit also on the economic dimension of Israel's role, which is a really important dimension and which is often brokered by the United States. Right. Um, but the the state of Israel and Egypt and Jordan um, both have um, different Uh, economic agreements with one another. Um, One of the most Dutch and the U.S. of course brokered these agreements. Um, One of the most detrimental ones for Egypt is uh, the production and sales of natural gas. Um, And there are a whole bunch of conditions that the U.S. put on Egypt including selling the natural a percentage of the natural gas um, back to Israel for even less than it costs to make in order to ensure that they continue to get U.S. aid. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. In Jordan, actually, we see that there are... um, like industrial settlements in Jordan. So Israeli factories have actually set up shop in Jordan, partially so that when you go to the store and you see, for example, Dead Sea products made in Jordan, some of them are made in these Israeli settlements in Jordan because they're realizing that this boycott um, of Israel is gaining traction. And so they're putting the name Jordan on there, but it's really um, for the profit of the Zionist state and Zionist companies. Um, And of course, also, there's a couple of different free trade zones along the Dead Sea and the Red Sea that really ensure Israeli profit. Um, And lastly, aside from (laughs) exploitation of um, 
natural resources in the Arab world. I think the main point is Israel's military force. So yeah. they're like the fourth largest military in the world. Um, and they really do play the role of the enforcer in the region. Um, they have this level of uh, military powder, power that plays as a threat to um, the rest of the region and colludes often with U.S imperial interest um, in the region. Yeah, absolutely. And you're speaking to, uh, for folks who may be less familiar, the BDS Boycott Divestment Sanctions Movement, um, which is specific to Israel, but obviously is 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 bigger than that. Um, so I just want to give a quick station ID. You're listening to 94.1 FM KPFA. I'm your host, Kat Petru, and I'm speaking with two members of the Palestinian youth movement. You're hearing the voices of Mesa Morar and Jennifer Moganum. Thanks again for being here. And before... Um, before they joined me, we had Lara Kiswani of the Arab Resource and Organizing Center talking about these Islamophobic... Um, anti-Arab uh, policies that have been put forth by our current administration. So let's jump to Trump's move of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. What does this mean for Palestinians all over the world and within Palestine? Yeah, I think this is a really important question. I think first, um, you know, as Lada had mentioned, really uh, declaring Jerusalem as the capital of Israel was really uh, a slap in the face, as she had said, to Palestinians all over the world. Um, and, and it is more so symbolically than it actually is, mostly because um, it's really a disregard um, of the people and the land and the people that are from there. And so basically by saying we say that this is now the capital, and and historically, Jerusalem has always been a site, a holy site for all of the three Abrahamic religions. It's always been a home for Muslims, Jews, and Christians. And so, to completely establish this really holy city and holy place to such a racist Zionist uh, state is. Um, is basically saying we don't care about the other people that are there. Right. Uh, we don't care what you think. And for a lot of the Palestinians that live in the diaspora, especially the ones here in the U.S. that cannot return, um, this was kind of like the final marker to say, yeah, this is not for you anymore. This is who it belongs to. Um, but really what it means for people on the ground, um, and as Jennifer can tell you, is that it's really not anything concrete for the people there. It's really just another thing for um, for Trump to have and say, just as much as he ha what he's done here in terms of uh, he's just saying things just to say them. Mm -hmm. um, they don't really take any actual effect for the people on the ground. And I'll just say a couple more things. So uh, on the issue of Trump's declaration of Jerusalem as the capital, as Mesa said, um, when speaking to comrades in Jerusalem, no one is really actually seeing that in any concrete way. That doesn't actually impact any change. Um, the only thing that is really happening is that because of that, um, there was an escalation and mobilizations and clashes, which resulted in more injury and death to Palestinians. Right. Um, but I also wanted to say one last thing, which is that um, in terms of the move of the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, um, I think you know, it's a really important move. At the same time, Tel Aviv is just as colonized as Jerusalem is. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that we want to remind folks of, um, is that Jerusalem is part of um, Palestine, but so is Tel Aviv. And so both of those lands have been taken away from us, and both of them are unacceptable places for the recognition yeah, of the state sure. of Israel. Yeah, yeah. thank you for saying that. That's, that's a really important... Um, that's important. So I know we have just a few minutes left, and I really want to make sure we talk about one more really Im important thing before we wrap up. So one way Israel continues to repress dissent is by incarcerating political prisoners. prisoners. Ahed Tamimi, in particular, is an example of a child who has been incarcerated for defending 
her family, according to Democracy Now!, she's six, well, she's 16 years old, and so she slapped an Israeli soldier after Israeli troops shot her 14 year old cousin in the head with a rubber coated steel bullet, fired tear gas canisters into her family's home. And we know that she was actually slapped first by an Israeli soldier. So, um, this is illegal child detention, and and why isn't she being highlighted right now in this alleged, in this feminist movement? Yeah, um, one thing I wanted to mention about Ahed before uh, we get to that question in particular uh, is the significance of Ahed in general. Uh, this is a young woman who has been a part of a resistance within her town and her family for years. This, If you go back in time, this little girl was out in the streets protesting when she was about eight years old, and you can see so much footage uh, of her and her family doing this. And so this specific attack on her is not, uh, is not solo and it's not just like different from any other attack on Palestinians it's specifically on her family on what her village of Nabi Saleh stands for and the fact that they have um, persistently stood up against the Israeli defense forces or I should say occupational forces um, and they're one of the villages that we kind of look to um, because they are so significant in their resistance going out into the streets peacefully protesting despite all of uh, what the settlers around them do and especially despite how much harassment they face all the time every day specifically this family um, but in particular I just wanted to share something um, I had Tamimi's father came here and her uncle came to do a tour and he talked about how how significantly they um, resist their family does and how sometimes some of the other families just tell them you know you're just putting too much attention on yourselves you guys should just really calm down and they're just like what are you talking about if if we don't do this who will and that really strikes a chord because they resist not just for themselves they resist for all of us here in the diaspora and they're people that we uh really commend for all of the work that they've been doing um and then i also wanted to do just a plug on january 31st we're actually holding um an action for ahad uh and so she will be spending her 17th birthday in behind bars or incarcerated and so i uh, we invite people to come out to the rally at the oakland federal building on january 31st that's this week for from 4.30 to 6 for the rally at the Oakland Federal Building. And then we will also be um, at Reams in Oakland, which is um, Palestinian food here at the Fruitvale Station from 6.15 to 9. So if you can't make it earlier, please come out to Reams as well. Thank you. And is there a Facebook event for that we can post? There definitely is a Facebook great. event. Great, 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 great. So we'll link to that event and we'll also link to the PYM website in on our website, on our page, kpfaapprentice.org. We are just about at time. Um, if you have like literally a parting word or sentence, you can share it and we can, we'll have you back. We can get, this is a huge conversation so we can do more. Of course. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to uh, let people know where to find us. You can find us at PYMUSA.com. You could also find us on Twitter, PYM underscore USA. And also we're really active on Facebook. Facebook, just Palestinian Youth Movement. You could also email us at pym at pymusa.com. Um, yep, and we'll link to all of that. Thank you Thank both you. so much for Thank being you. here. This is great. Thank yes. you so much. Thank so you. as you can hear by that music, that brings us to the end of tonight's show. Tune in next week to Full Circle for Puerto Rico and Disaster Capitalism Round 2 with our own Laura Laboricua Chegaray. Our executive producer is Miss M. Our technical director is Frank Sterling. Joy Moore is our production consultant. I've been your host, Kat Petru. Thank you to Laura on the board and um, Sharon from G43, our tech assistant. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight on F Full Circle. Stay tuned. La Onda Bajita is next. Listening to We Rise here on 89.3 FM KPFB, and that was a rebroadcast of my show with the First Voice Apprenticeship Program's Full Circle on KPFA. So up next is not actually La Onda Bajita, but more of KPFB's weekend programming. You can find this show and all the We Rise shows archived on mixcloud.com backslash We Rise Radio. And for ideas, and collaboration, please reach out at danceisrevolutionary at gmail.com. 
Tune in next week to hear an episode of Feral Visions featuring radical scholar for Palestinian liberation, Dr. Rabab Abdulhadi. Thanks so much for tuning in and have a beautiful weekend.